morning, everyone. I've been a little under the weather this week, so uh, if you could put, put my, my voice, and I may cough a little bit, if we can put up with that, then that would be great. Do we have, uh... awesome. All right, so I want to talk to you today about our company's little moonshot to try to eliminate the two weeks notice paradigm, something that I've become completely frustrated with. I'd like you to meet Diane. Diane's a tiny Pulse user. She's got a great culture, really works on it. She might be the CEO of the company. She could be the head of human resources or culture. Great Glassdoor reviews, has won a bunch of awards. And, you know, Diane is, is, is happy about her, her culture. And she uh, really thinks that she's a great place to work. Sorry, we, uh, we disappeared from the screen here. All right, we're back. So it's really surprising and disheartening to Diane when an employee who th she thought was happy and she mentored and worked with comes to her and gives her two weeks notice. And the problem is this has become the norm in companies. And I would argue it's actually a, a relic from the command and control era of leadership that needs to go away. But an employee gets a new job or quits and they leave the company and it creates a lot of, of, of problems. And it, it's a broken paradigm. I, the employer has to rush to fill the gap. They have no opportunity to fix the issue. Or they come to their wits end and they say, sorry, Jim, you got to go. And here's two weeks severance. The employee leaves on a bad note. They might not know that they're leaving on a bad note. This might actually come up later on when reference checks future in, in, down, down the line. They leave with a trust deficit, uh, clearly based on how they left. And, and they usually just don't do their best work at the end. And so why does this happen? You know, this happens because honest conversations are really not encouraged on both sides. The paradigm is to not talk about these problems, to, to, to sort of bury them and pretend they don't exist. And I want to ask everyone why we would accept this in the work setting when we would not accept it in our personal life. Can you imagine if your partner came to you and said, so, you know, I'm kind of moving from Seattle to Boston two weeks. I found a new husband, and I have a new house. And, you know, and, and I'm letting you know I'm just going to give you two weeks' notice. You'd say, you never told me anything. We never talked. This is ridiculous. But as crazy as that sounds, we've actually come to accept this in the workplace. And, and we think that it's time to, to blow it up. So what does Diane really want? Diane wants not to be surprised. She wants honest conversations with employees about what the problem is. She wants a chance to fix it and to support them if they're going to leave. But, but most of all, she wants respect on both sides of, of no matter what happens or what the outcome is. And how do I know this? Because like Di Diane, our company has really been through this over the years. I'm focused on building a great culture. We've had, been fortunate to win a lot of best places to, to work awards, and we put a lot of time and effort into this. So I was really frustrated when people gave two weeks notice, and it, I, I like to try to break paradigms and do things a different way, and I really dug in, and I was like, we have to figure out how to break this. It's completely at odds with the culture that we're trying to build. So about five years ago, I started looking around at what other companies were doing really inspired by uh, Netflix's approach. If, uh, if you haven't read the Netflix Culture Deck by Patty McCord, I told Tyler about it, and he was reading it at midnight last night. It's really the, the best thing to ever come out of Silicon Valley. And here is this culture that treated people, high performance culture, treated them really well, but, but they were honest with them. And when people didn't work out, they gave them six to 12 months severance, they didn't beat around the bush, and they kind of just moved on in, in a healthy way. And there was an article I found five years ago. This was really like a formative sentence for me that I read from Patty. And it said, here's what I'm going to need six months from now, the talent and skills. And then you tell her, it's not you. I don't want you to fail. I don't want to publicly humiliate you. And then she goes on to say, you know, you'd be nice to them, but you'd be fair. And you know, Netflix makes a ton of money, so they're able to pay out these really generous severances. So this led us down a, a, a path. And we thought about this, and I talked with my head of culture, and we said, we love the Netflix policy, but we don't have the Netflix deep pockets. We're, we're about a 40-person company at the time. We're 120 today. And we said, but what can we do? And, and, and we started to really rethink the two weeks notice. 
and encourage people to be open. We said to people, look, if you come and talk to us about your happiness or a problem, we promise we will not walk you to the door. You can trust us on this. We want to get into these issues. We want to um, talk about it. And I don't know that we communicated effectively, but we started doing it. And if you've heard the thing, you have to, uh, I'll, t I'll say it seven times, but you have to say something seven times before people really take it in. That, that, that is true. Um, but, but we stuck with it. And, and as this was going on, we ran into a situation with someone who I'll call Jim, who was our patient zero, where Jim had been on a PIP, and Jim had sort of, the typical thing on a PIP, gone down, bounced back, and Jim was a really nice guy, and everyone loved Jim. But objectively, Jim wasn't doing a great job at, at his job. And we sat down with Jim, and after the PIP, we said, look, we could fire Jim, but, but Jim's a nice guy. We're in a client service business, so this is really disruptive to our business to fire people. Let's have an honest conversation with Jim. We said, look, we don't want to do another PIP. It seems like you want to do something else. And he said, yeah. I said, well, why don't we try this? Like, let's, let's set a few months, continue to work for the clients, be honest with us. Why don't you start your job search? We'll support you, and let's do this sort of in an open book way and, and see how it goes. And we fumbled our way through it, and we made some mistakes. But ultimately, it was the genesis for what we call our mindful transition program. And in summary, our goal is to end the new two weeks notice paradigm. And, and I say paradigm because I think this goes both ways. I think it's the employee giving two weeks notice or the employer laying someone off suddenly or firing them and then giving two weeks severance or more. And, and it starts with creating a culture that's based on trust, a lot of open and honest communication, and a commitment to mutually beneficial and respectful outcomes. And one thing I want to be clear about, when you put this program in place, it doesn't mean that people leave. And we'll talk a little bit about what it means on how you might identify issues, solve them, and move people around. But everyone's being mindful. They're being open. And they're all, the, the transition part is that some th things need to change when there's problems. Sometimes that means that people leave, or sometimes it means that you change things early on. Foundation of safety. This program, big warning sign, will not work unless you create a foundation of safety. It all starts with people being open and honest about their challenges, if they're feeling happy or fulfilled in their role. And it's really about removing the taboo uh, of, of people potentially leaving your company and feeling protected that if they speak up, they will not be walked to the door. And that has been our promise. You tell us you don't want to work here and you're miserable, we will not walk you to the door. And that's the only way to get these honest conversations started. Next, you really have to train the stakeholders. This is the seven things. One of the things we learned really early on was that the managers are absolutely key in this. If, if you're aware of the, the, the concept of cognitive dissonance, you know, this, is, this is really at play with, with managers. So managers don't want to be left because they think that's reflective on themselves. And they don't want to have these difficult conversations with their team members because they haven't done them before. And it may surface some things, as Howard talked about, that are uncomfortable to him. So we've really trained our managers on how to handle the warning signs of employee happiness, be ready to let their people leave, if that's the right choice, and, and understand that this will take time, them repeating and getting their teams to talk honestly before people trust this. It is, this is an evolution. This definitely took us two to three years to get it right. I, I will make the case that a lot of your people, have, have anyone heard the expression quit and stay? Yeah. A lot of your people have actually already quit your company. They just work there. And, and frankly, those are the most dangerous people. So, so ignorance is not bliss. And, and there's a mistake in this program, and I'll get into this later, that, that people think that not knowing is better than knowing. And it's not the case. So we, these are our collection pots for information. We have our quarterly said reviews, but it's really check-ins on how people are doing. These are the direct. Our managers have one-to-ones with their employees. And we do informal chatting how it's going. On a group basis, we use Tiny Pulse, and we get great suggestions. Start, stop, continue lists are an awesome tool. What are things that we should start? What are things we should stop? What are things we could continue? Different people will bring up the same problem in a different way either start, stop, or continue. So it gives them different avenues to get it up on the, on the board. And then we try to do town halls where people can submit questions. If I was doing it here with you, we'd let them submit them anonymously or directly. I try to actually, as Howard said, not have any preparation. I prefer to not have preparation so that people believe we're just answering those honestly. And one of the phrases that we've gotten really used to saying at every check-in and talking to people, are you happy and present and engaged? 
And actually, we use engagement as happiness as a proxy for engagement. And I think engagement is really where the, the, the rubber hits the road. On every check-in, the manager will say to the employee on a scale of one to five, how, how happy, present, or engaged on you. Now, one of our core values is own it. So if the employee doesn't answer that or sort of lies or moves around it, they're actually starting to demonstrate that they're not a good fit for our culture, and that's probably going to show up in a different place. I love this view because I think this represents a lot of the uh, uh, problems that companies or the difference between what you see on the surface and, and, and what's going on underneath. So it's really important in, in our world, and we've created taxonomies around this, on getting to the root of unhappiness and, and, and dissatisfaction. Most people are dealing with a symptom, and I'll talk about that a few times. And you don't have to squint at the bottom because I'll blow them up on the next slides, but, but we've boiled this down and, and to three buckets of discontentment. And I think you know, if the employee is disengaged or unhappy, they approach the manager to start a discussion. And if the manager is unhappy or frustrated in any way, they have to think about what the issue is and then get ready to uh, talk to the employee with the goal to get to the root. And this requires a lot of, of why questions. And I think at the end, there's three different routes, and they lead to three different outcomes with what you do in each situation. So route one, things the employee can change and want to change. Most times, this is actually things that are on the employee. There's personal stress going on, there's money issues, there's relationship, there's stuff going on outside of work that they're bringing to work that, that's clearly showing up in their performance. There may be a little beat down or stagnant. In some cases, they may actually need new training and skills. The job's growing above them, and they need to up their skills. But I put these all in the bucket of they're 100% in the employee's control to address, and they have to be aware of them and, and committed to them. Second bucket, things the company can change. So the employee discusses some issues. Maybe there's a bad boss who isn't supporting or challenging them properly. Maybe they feel underpaid or deserving of a promotion, and you say, you know what, this person is really deserving of a promotion, and they are really underpaid. So you, you believe that the issue needs to be corrected. Maybe they're not being challenged enough. They actually need to be, to be moved up or some sort of change internally that you support. But after sitting down, you say, you know what, these are on us to fix, and, and, and we can do that, and we think that that will um, fix the problem. This is the most important bucket. Things that won't change uh, or you don't want to change. I think this is where companies make a lot of mistakes in not getting down to this. So the first is a core value fit. You just heard Howard talk about that. If someone is not a core value fit for your organization, nothing else matters, and you probably need to move into the process of moving them out of the organization. But there's smaller things maybe that bother them that aren't going to change about how you work. Or they want to get promoted, they want to raise, and you're thinking they're overpaid and should be demoted. So, so those, are, those are things that are going to be a little bit uh, incongruous. Or they really want to do something different, and that different is not at your organization. Or maybe their role is changing, and then they're not qualified for the new role. So the problem is these are systemic things that are not going to change. And this is where it requires a lot of difficult and raw conversations. Perfect Tiny Pulse example. Someone posted in our uh, Tiny Pulse, I suggest that AP implements an annual wage increase at a minimum reflects the annual CPI inflation rate. The US has an average of 2%. 2.11% for the year 2011, according to the CPI index, if wages don't increase, our nominal wage decreases and we're essentially earning each money each year. You get the point. So guess what I did? I got out of a company call and I said, hey, we're never going to do this. We, have, we are a performance-oriented culture. We actually don't believe in people paying people more for the same job next year. We have market-based adjustments, we have merit-based adjustments, and we have promotion-based adjustments. And if you are really excited about a CPI-based adjustment, you're probably not working at the, at the right company. So we were honest about this, and I'm guessing that this prompted a, a discussion with this person on, hey, if this is really going to bug you, it's not going to change, and we may need to talk about if this is the right place for you, because I can pretty much guarantee you we're never going to have a, a, a CPI-based program. The point on something like this that starts small is that this is the symptom but it reflects an underlying condition. If you wait on something like this and don't dig into it, it's going to manifest itself in much larger dissatisfaction. Those of you that use the traction system, entrepreneurial operating system in all your companies, we've borrowed this phrase that we love called IDS, identify and discuss and solve. So you have these three routes, and you have three choices here. 
the employee addresses those issues we talked about and it gets better and you're good, the employee deployer changes the things that were the problem and it also fixes the problem, or you, you identify this as unfixable. The employee can't do what they thought they needed to do or they don't understand what they need to do. You're very aware of what they want you to do and you don't want to change it because it's core to who your culture is. Uh, or again, it's structural. We have most of our people working from home. If people want to work in an office with 30 people, that's not going to be there. We're not going to fix that. We should really um, admit to that. Now, a lot of you might be saying, what about the performance improvement plan? I hate performance improvement plans. I, 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 and to be fair, I think there is some, uh, some circumstances where they make sense. But I would caution you to begin with the end in mind. I think a lot of people use PIPs and they're advised by their lawyers to use PIPs because they think that will protect them legally. It does not protect you legally. If you knew you were gonna get rid of this person and you put them through a whole PIP and sort of force them to fail and document it, you're actually gonna make them more angry. And I've heard people time and time again say that it hasn't protected them at all. In fact, it made the situation worse. And, and, and the issue again is these don't deal with the root of the issue, they deal with a symptom. If three people have a headache and you give them Tylenol, so which a PIP is, and one is dehydrated, you know, one is allergic to gluten and the other has brain cancer, they're very different roots of why they have a headache. And I consider the PIP the Tylenol. So I think PIPs can work in that first case when the employee is just a little off track, a little stagnant, they need kind of a wake up call. But if you're doing this as a band-aid, it's really a short term solution and you should figure out what the right long term solution is. If you know you don't want that employee to be working at your company at the end of the PIP, don't put them on a PIP. It, it, it's disingenuous and it, and it really won't save you from being sued. So we talked about how you can fix some of the internal issues. Let's talk about when we want to start moving to an external transition and what that looks like. We always prefer employee-initiated transitions. That's what we call them. The whole point of the mindful transition process is to encourage people to recognize for themselves that it's time for them to move on, it's time for them to do something different, and then hopefully as a manager, you've established enough trust with them that they feel comfortable having that conversation. It's always better for them to drive it, and some great questions that you can ask is, you know, what do you want to do? How can we support you? Have them come to it. My kids go to overnight camp, and the analogy I like to use is, we put them on a bus at the beginning of the summer, and when they get on the bus, you know, they're waving goodbye, and they're happy, and they go off, and then three weeks later, when we see them at visiting day, and we spend the day with them and they leave, there's a lot more difficulty and tears. So that, that is the same thing here. If the employee can drive this, then you're gonna be a lot better off, and if you can help them identify to drive this, everything that comes after, which is the same, is easier. But that won't always happen. You, you will need the, what we call the employer-initiated transition. And the only really difference about this is, is who starts it. And at this point, it's not really an option anymore in terms of how you're presenting it. I think the biggest three cases where you would start an employer-initiated transition are, are just systemic performance issues, um, a change in their role where it's just not gonna be the right fit anymore, or a misalignment of values I said before where you say, look, this is dead on arrival. This person doesn't have our core values and they need to not be working here in the not too immediate future. So what does a transition look like? It has a few components and this is where through our trial and error and made a lot of mistakes, we realized you need all of these in order for this to work well. So the first is have a written plan. You should not wing this. You should sit down with the employee. We're gonna begin a transition uh, program and here's what it's gonna look like. Here's the timeline. Here's how we're gonna do all this and, and, and lay it out because what we realized early on when we talked about expectations in, in, in patient zero was, was he sort of thought it was going on forever. We thought it was going on for 60 days. We realized we hadn't laid out the time frame that we needed to do. Like anything, communication is absolutely key. You need to be clear here about communication internally and externally. When we communicate that people are leaving our company, it's always in the same way. Uh, Janelle is leaving in two weeks. We wish her the best of luck. She's leaving in four weeks. No one knows whether people were in a mindful transition, where they weren't, they were leaving, we knew otherwise. We sort of thank everyone for their service and, and move on. We don't celebrate people leaving, but we're just super respectful and, and, and friendly about it. We also give people the choice and we say, look, at, at some point people are gonna need to know internally um, that work with you about this, that you're in a transition program. 
you can tell them or we can tell them or we can tell them when, when the time comes. But we really try to let the employee control that. Clear timetable. Couple different factors here. We usually shoot for 60 to 90 days where we say, hey look, here's, here's the window and this should, this should be the time frame and then there's an end date. So it's gonna end on this day and, and, and that just provides clarity for everyone. The exception to this, there are a couple things Let's say someone is moving or they're going back to school, so then there's one of these cases where they're a high performer but there's a structural change in their life. We're happy to have them work for us for nine months. You know, if they're going back to school in nine months and they're a high performer, this is the type of conversation, why would you want them to give you two weeks notice before they go back to business school? Like, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. This could have been uh, an open conversation. So high performer who's gonna do something different or we know about, great. Other situations, better. And, and, and look, you need to, you need to be willing to cut it at any time if there are problems, but more often than not, there are not any problems. Leads and recommendations. Part of the quid pro quo, I open up my Rolodex. I've made a lot of introductions to people. I tell them to go through my LinkedIn. Uh, do we have companies? Do we have clients? Do we have partners? I have a bunch of templates in which I've made introductions for people who are working with me in a transition program and even explaining to people, hey, we have this program and John is really wants to do something different. He doesn't want to be in client services anymore. He identified this job of your organization, uh, I think he'd be a great fit, and uh, you know, they're getting a letter from the CEO recommending their employee for their company, and it also looks good on everyone that we're in an open discussion and John's not leaving us in the lurch. So again, people behave well during their transition, then we're open to really supporting them. Third party support, so we might uh, offer training, we might offer outplacement, we work with a PEO, a global PEO that has a lot of services, it just depends on what that person needs. Internal resources. You have a culture team, you have a recruiter, you can help them with a resume, look over it, practice interviewing. You know, one of the things that our um, culture head will do is practice interviewing them, explaining the transition program and why they're looking for a job and we know about it and they're, and they're working there. So we, we, we make any of our internal resources available uh, to folks who are in a transition program. And then the last is make it personal. I think there's some really cool options. Again, we would much rather use money towards, uh, not towards severance, but towards outcomes. And actually, I think my head of culture was at this conference two years ago, and a company that had elements of this told her a story where the job was changing, guy was transitioning out, they, they set aside some money and actually sent him to some development, developer training, bought him a suit, you know, did a couple things that cost like $2,000 to help him get that next job. Much better investment than severance for not working there, and also just kind of a more positive outcome. So we ask a couple things of employees, really only, only two things in, in the process. So the first is they have to stay engaged and performing. We're looking for ha happy clients and happy results. And I would argue they actually do, in most cases, stay engaged. I know people don't believe this, but they know the end is the, near. They know we're helping them. Um, actually, I think when people are behaving poorly, it's because they don't know um, what's coming at, at, at the end. So again, we're just looking at how the what does the work product look like? Are clients happy? Are they being served? And, and we, do, we will cut it at any time. If performance drops, we feel like they're getting toxic. It really it doesn't happen too often. There are some circumstances where we would do it shorter, particularly if they're coming off like a team where everyone is not, not getting along, but we, but we monitor that carefully. And then the second part is we just ask for uh, transparency and, and open communication. So they keep us in the loop about their job search and process. They communicate proactively to eliminate the surprise factor. And then once they find a job, we ask them to give as much notice as possible. And this is one of those interesting things where you know, it's tricky. They're not going to turn down a job. We want more than two weeks when we've given them three months. But if they get a job and some of the employees really need them to start. However, if we've been open throughout the process, if they've said, hey, I'm going into company X to interview. Hey, I'm in final rounds. Hey, I'm expecting an offer in the next week. We really have gotten more like four to six weeks, even if they have to give two weeks at the end. So this transparency really helps. And it's great to not be lying. It's great to not have doctor's appointments and all this you know, stuff at the end where you look back and you say, God, that guy just, you know, I, would, I would said okay, I said okay, okay, and then I really, you know, the, 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 I should have said this earlier, but there's a lot of studies that, that the end of an experience affects the memory of the entire experience. And, and so how people leave 
after five years of good work, how they leave can, can really uh, impact you know, your memory of that, and, and particularly when someone calls you for a reference a few years in the future, versus being able to, anyone who's left under this program under great conditions is able to give me as a name and have the CEO call and, and give them a reference, which is a huge asset to them, rather than having to skip a company. So we see this as really about creating a win-win. I think the reality today is that it's a small world. Everyone has a voice, positively, negatively, all over social media. It's just not worth having this angry person out there on Glassdoor and elsewhere making your life miserable when you could you know, do a little more or go out of your way to build an active alumni group who's out there being a positive uh, force for you. And I want to give you a great case study of, of this where we created an ecosystem. So we had a guy on our team, he'd been with us for three years. This is Daniel, this is actually his email on the last day, so I'll use his, his real name because we've been public about this. He really liked analytics, and we had a client that had a really heavy analytics component to what they were doing with us. They ended up taking that in-house after a few years. And because we were having these open and honest conversations, the kind of early detection method, Daniel you know, was able to say to us, look, I, this is kind of what I want to do. And, and when the client took this in-house and we looked at it objectively, we said, we're not going to have this role for a year, year and a half. Someone from Apple sent us a job rec. Two people on the management team looked at it and they said, this is Daniel's dream job. They sent it to me, I said, yeah, it is. This is, he, he can double his pay, move to California, you know, work for Apple. So I reached out to him, I said, look, I don't want you to leave, but we think this is your dream job. If you want to go for it, go for it. We don't have this job for about a year and a half. He told, you know, he called us, thanked us, said he wanted to do it, kept us in, in the interview process, got the job. Because we had referred him to the company, they were flexible in him starting in four to six weeks. Fast forward two years later, this is one of our biggest clients now that we're working with in some context. And, and so it's a great outcome, great example of putting sort of a positive outcome into the world versus a situation that if we had let it go on, he would have been unhappy and, and discontented. There is a paradox, however, in, in, in mindful transition. And, and I think this will resonate with a lot of you. And that is, if you have a great culture, it can be really hard and you're a great place to work for people to identify that they're unhappy and that they're not in the right job anymore and that they're not doing the right thing because they like their coworkers and they like the company. And it, it's, it's, this requires even some more difficult conversations and, and pushing. And, and case study here, we had uh, an employee a few years ago, and let me just, we'll, we'll, we'll call her Sarah, and we'll say that Sarah was working on 50% A and 50% B as part of her job. And she really loved A, but the job was becoming more B, and loved working at our company. And so we, we sat in conversations with Sarah, we said, you know, we think this job's gonna go more B, and, and it doesn't seem like you wanna do, you wanna do A, and she said, yeah, I really wanna do A. So what we decided with her was, we, we sent her to some training for A, worked on A, and continued to watch our needs, we had our sort of moment of truth with Sarah. We said, look, this job is actually going to be 90% B, and it's what we need the most. We agreed to sort of a six-month transition plan and where Sarah could start looking around because, again, she was in that high-performing bucket. Sarah got an amazing job as a director of A at another company, about a 30% raise. We hired someone who was a director of just B and, and just was able to do a better job at B because that's what she wanted to do and has been just a star performer for us in B. So again, a really good example of having that discussion, knowing what people need, and seeing if you can find the win-win the solution. So I've talked about this a lot. I will tell you that a lot of people challenge me, say this won't work, this is ridiculous, uh, and all of those people have one thing in common. They've never tried it, never even started to try it. They're just sitting there thinking this is way outside of their comfort zone, making judgment. So, so I've heard it all, and I'll be around afterwards, and I will debate any of these points with you if you want to bring it. People will steal, the work will be poor, it won't work for senior employees, it won't work for junior employees. I'll go back to what I said earlier. This, everyone saying this stuff is, is happier with the quit and stay and the stuff that they don't know than the stuff that they, the person who's already stealing, they're already copying everything, 
You talk about how Howard talked about five-year plan. They've got their one-year plan on how they're going to screw you. They've been, they, they're stealing a little bit month by month. Literally, my friend was like this at a company. He had a toxic boss. He had a one-year plan on how he was going to leave this company, and not that he was going to steal, but what he was going to do when he was going to approach HR and all this stuff. Do you think they got a great year out of him um, in his last year? But I, but I do want to address this last one because it's the most common. I'll debate any of the others offstage. And that is, they're already toxic, negative. It's really better to show them the door. And this is where I think we're all a little bit off on the calendar. So let's talk about, let's pretend we're in, we're in 2018. Let's go back to January. So in January 2018 is when you had this employee that had this kernel of discontent that came up. What we're talking about is the lower track. We really dug into this. Rather than passing over it, doing the PIP, doing the Tylenol, we really dug in and we either figured out the things that we needed to fix and did that, or we got them on a transition, and so we pulled them out of the yellow into green so that they're ending on a high. The other company didn't. They glossed over it. And so now, you know, we're in the, uh, you know, September time frame, and they're in the quit and stay, and then they're starting to interview, and I agree with you. By the time they've already quit and stay and interview, they're probably toxic and you don't want them around. What is fundamentally different around this program is this shift in the timetable, and that you're diving into these issues early and stopping them before you get to that point. When everyone tells me you can't do this, you can't have people stay for two to three months, they're envisioning that person who's already done and damaged and gone, not this person who's having productive conversations at the beginning of the process. Question you know, for the room and, and, and leaders often is, what if my company doesn't want to do this? And it, it, it's a good question, right? It's a hard to push this as a company. I'd argue that any team leader can make this sort of open, transparent system the default for their team. They can go to their folks and they can say, look, this is how we're going to operate. I want you to be open and honest. They can make this fit within whatever the company does by having more information and knowing sooner. So don't think just because your company doesn't do this that you can't do this within a team, because I think it's, if you've read Kim Scott's Radical Candor, I, I think you can just adopt a whole different level of, of open and honest discourse with your team. There's just far too many companies out there, um, including yours, as I said, with great cultures, but they just don't know how to deal with people leaving. What we realized is, as I said earlier, this is, this is like an old playbook. People are using this, this, this playbook from the command and control era, and they just don't have this new playbook. And, and, and so we hope, what I hope is that this can help be a playbook for you. We're also, my head of culture and I are finishing the actual book that documents all of this because people have said to us, how do you do this? It's actually forced us to really think through a lot of these decision trees and, and, and map it all, all out. But you know, I, above all, one of the things we do is, if you're going to do this, really start incorporating it into your company discussions early. We talk about this when people start. We talk about this before they start. I say, look, this is how we operate transition. So if you're taking a risk to come to our company and it doesn't work out, it's not going to be a disaster. And believe it or not, that's an interesting asset um, in the recruiting process. But I really wholeheartedly believe that, that it's time for us to, to blow up the two weeks notice paradigm. We're working on it. We're trying to change it. It's, it's, not, it's not perfect, but, but we think we found a better way. And I hope that you will all dig into this and, and see what it could do for your organization. Thank you very much. Well, I, I love that when you said that uh, other people will doubt, is, but they've never tried it before, right? <laughs> I actually, there was a video online of me talking about this program really only one or two slides very quickly. And when I presented this at another conference, a guy came up to me afterwards. He said, I saw the video. I was struggling with two of these great people in my company not knowing what to do. I did this. I was shocked how well it worked. So it was really, it was really interesting in terms of, and I think that was sort of validating that a lot of people just haven't, haven't tried it. Yeah. So I think you just already answered the slide of question number one, which was, when do you actually share it with people? So you're sharing it with them even before they start and on the onboarding process, which is great. The number two most requested question is, Bob, how do you deal with a recommendation request when the employee was not a great performer? So, so great question. And uh, I, I operate on sort of the, one of my, I operate on Howard's principle. I always say something in our company, there's always the best version of the truth. 
So in terms of my referrals, I will never say something that's untrue. A lot of people are not a great performer because they're not in the right seat, so I would answer something honestly. If they were a terrible performer, I, I wouldn't give them a recommendation, and they probably have enough emotional intelligence not to do that. But I would be very comfortable with someone who looked, just wasn't want to do client service, the example uh, of Daniel, and say he'd be really great in a product whatever role. So I try to be very specific within those recommendations. A lot of time, and now as the company's gotten bigger, those recommendations aren't coming from me because I haven't worked with a person versus I might be opening a door. But I, but I think there's a, there's a truthful answer. We do not stick a problem person onto someone else. But remember, I think problem is towards the end. If you dive in early and figure out why this person's not working, they're probably a great person in the wrong seat. And if you see that they're finding a place at the right seat, I would never recommend that if they were basically going to the same thing again, I thought they would make the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. Great. And then how do you approach the person who's a good performer, but who does not uphold the values of the organization? Yeah, I, I think that if you have great core values and you reward them and talk about them and promote them, you know, our bi-weekly call is the core value shout outs. Our promotions, we talk about core values. Our annual company awards are actually the core value awards. Most of the people get it, they feel out of place and they opt out. As Howard said, if we're saying what we do and do what we say, they kind of opt out. Uh, they realize, you know what, they're really consistent. One of our core values is own it, and I always like to say to people, there's people like, oh, I really like that core value, and then they get there and like, oh, I didn't really realize like, <laughs> what you meant by that. Um, and that's really accountable, but, but they, tend, they tend to opt out, um, or you, know, you just have a discussion that like, this isn't the right place for you, it doesn't feel like the right, the right fit. Yeah. Great, great. And then, um, Bob, I love your philosophy, philosophy, but I feel like my voice won't be heard and I can't get the resources to adopt it because I'm not the CEO. How do I start? Uh, I would refer to that last slide and start a little clandestine operation within, <laughs> within, X. Yeah, within your group of employees. I, I think, actually, if you feel like this is just way too big and out there for the company to take on, I would actually test it uh, with a few employees or, or do it in a group. What I didn't make clear before was, you, look, if, if people are used to, t what, if the company is seeing two weeks no notice and they're just used to that, they don't have to know what happened before that. They don't have to know that you and that person had an agreement and that they were going to search for jobs and that you, you were looking for their replacement. All they'll see was, hey, like that person left, they left on good notes, the replacement's here and all that stuff. So I would probably try to beta test this in a small group, then go to some of the leaders and say, we've been trying this and this seems like a system that works. Great. So a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot. So what if someone's behavior has become toxic? and you don't want them to impact others for the 60 to 90 day time frame. Yep. So, so it's a good point, and, and I talk about this in the book. I think the goal of all this stuff, if you do this right, is they, they aren't at the point of toxicity. And, and I'll repeat that again, because I think most people that are toxic, it's been a problem that just hasn't dealt with. But where there were some problems with the team or where there's some struggles, we've, we've done a shortened transition, or we've done kind of what we would call an external transition, where we actually don't have them working there with their team anymore, maybe working on some special project. I still would rather pay people to do work than I would pay them not to work. Uh, that, 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 that is something that's never made sense to me. So, so we're careful um, about that. It, it doesn't really happen that often, but that is where we've done sort of this external, where they work on some special projects, maybe it's only six weeks, kind of on the side, but we remove them out of the team or out of causing any, any internal problems. Got it. And then, so the last question is, wh what is the difference between a formal PIP and this, this process that you have? Is this smoke and mirrors, or is there something fundamentally different there? Yeah, it's a great question. So we actually sit down with people when we identify these problems, and, and we kind of offer them the blue pill or the red pill. So we, <laughs> and then that is the discussion. So hey, seems like we're having all these problems. We can do a PIP. But in our experience with these situations, here's what happens. Or we have this other alternative where we could work on something for 90 days and help you find a, a better job. Understand that if you take the red pill or the PIP and that doesn't work out, the blue pill is, is, is probably not, not there anymore because we're probably not going to be getting along and it's not going to be going well at that point. Um, but that, that is really how we do it. We actually strongly 
discourage pips because we believe that they are dealing with the, the, the outcomes and not the, not the core issue. And, and, and if you don't fix the core issue, then you're just gonna be at a pip again in, in 69 days. And most people perform better, shockingly, during their pip. Uh, <laughs> and, and then, you know, it's really 60 to 90 days when all the same things happen mm. because you haven't addressed anything. Wow, amazing tips. And Thank you, Bob. Thank That's you. Great.